Good evening, everybody. And welcome again tonight to this 2012 lecture series of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, sponsored by the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, the UWI's Department of History and Philosophy, the National Cultural Foundation, the Central Bank of Barbados, and the Insurance Corporation of Barbados. This 2012 lecture series follows the theme quoted from Clement Payne, this is the time to knock on the door of your government, quote unquote. The 1937 Lib Rebellion, the 75th anniversary of the 1937 Lib Rebellion. This is the third lecture in this series and tonight to deliberate is Professor Pedro Welch of the University of the West Indies Cafield Campus of the Department of History and Philosophy and Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education. Professor Pedro Welch, I am of course, I'm George Bell, who you've met before. And I have the honor to chair tonight. Professor Pedro Welch graduated from the UWI KFL with the BA Honors in Caribbean and Latin American Studies in 1981. And subsequently, he was awarded a Commonwealth Fellowship and completed the MSc in Development Studies at the University of Bath, United Kingdom. He later pursued the PhD at the UWI by way also of a fellowship at John Hopkins University. As I said, he is the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Education at Cape Hill and Professor of Social and Medical History in the Department of History and Philosophy. He took up these posts after serving firstly as Program Assistant to the Pro Vice Chancellor, Academic Affairs, and the Subwarden Sherlock Hall, and then later as Assistant Registrar Examinations and Student Support Services Coordinator at the University of the West Indies Distance Education Center. He has served as Secretary Treasurer of the Association of Caribbean Historians and on the board of Caribbean Union College, now the University of the Southern Caribbean. He is a member of the editorial board of the Journal of Caribbean History. Professor Welch is also the recipient of the 2009 UWI Cavill Principals Award for Excellence in the academic, academic and administrative categories and of an award as a supervisor of one of the best PhD theses in academic year 2009-2010 and the award of Alumnus of the Month for November 2010 in recognition of the attainment of a professorship and his contribution to the university and campus. The publication and research interests of Professor Welch are History of Enslavement in the New World, the Jewish Diaspora in the New World, Women in Caribbean Slave Societies, the History of Medicine in the 18th, 19th, and 20th century Caribbean, the History of the Sugar Industry in the Caribbean, Kinship and Family in Caribbean Slave Societies, Fishing and other non-sugar occupations as alternatives to the estate labor market in post-emancipation societies. And Professor Welch is the author of Slave Society in the, um, in the City, published by Ian Randall Publishers, 2003. He is the author of United States Caribbean Relations, the Grenada Invasion and Caribbean Political Decision Making by Verlag Publishers, 2009 and several, several other works on the enslavement of Africans in the Caribbean, women's history, poor whites in Barbados, and the history of medicine 
So it is with great pleasure that I invite Professor Pedro Welch to give this third lecture in this 75th anniversary series. Um, thank you, thank you, Chair. Of course, Dr. Bell is my colleague, and Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of the West Indies, um, Kiefield Campus. Um, let me acknowledge um, the presence of the person um, who is partially responsible for my being here, and that is my mother, who, um, who happens to be here um, tonight. And of, and of course, um, she's accompanied by my sister, who has come to um, give me some moral support tonight. Um, the series that um, we've been having over the past few weeks is a very important one because it, it invites us to contemplate, to look at, and to, and to survey a period that has done so much to shape the, um, the current um, economic, political, and social climate um, in the Caribbean. In that context, therefore, um, I feel honored and privileged to be able to share um, tonight on the issue of the British Caribbean labor rebellions, um, a synthesis of the historical factors. In reviewing the course of unrest across the Caribbean that took place in the 1930s, I wish to point out that it is not my intention to reinvent the wheel. In the lectures which have preceded this one, listeners and other participants would have been exposed to the peculiar features of the Barbadian socio-political and economic landscape of the period under survey. It is inevitable since the island shares so much of the pre-1930s history you have with other Caribbean territories that we will find some commonalities in our treatment. Nevertheless, we will also find some peculiarities um, throughout the region as well. In order then to unlock the pan-Caribbean experience, and I will ask you to permit me to speak about pan-Caribbean experience. It is useful for us, firstly, um, to pick up some of the political elements that are common across the region, and then um, again to pick out those peculiarities in the immediate post-emancipation period right into the 1930s. Thus, let me say that I'm of a vintage um, which, while it is not, um, was not of the, of the particular period, I'm of a vintage that, that still saw the remnants of that period in, this, in the early formation of a Barbadian society. I recall as a young boy in the parish of, of, of St. Thomas, very close to, um, to the border of St. Joseph in an area called Clifton Hill. I'm sitting at the feet of what they call the griots, many of the old persons in the, in the village who at night, particularly when the night was moonlit, would regale us with stories of the past. Of course, some of the stories were, were, were colored by, um, by some, of the, some discussions of goblins and steel donkeys and those things that went bump in the night. But here and there, um, occasionally, those persons who were more closely connected with the events of the 1930s than it was to share some of those, some of those elements. And therefore, as I turn to look at the, at the, and the trace in, in the pan-Caribbean experience, what is the nature of that political experience that, that shapes um, the region and, and informs us as to what happened in the 1930s? I am immediately reminded of the old debt to those pioneers who uh, spent so much time um, fighting against oppression. In that immediate post-emancipation period, right up to the 1930s, it became clear that the planter oligarchy everywhere was determined to deny the expectations of emancipation held by the formerly enslaved and their descendants. By the time that we reached the 1930s, three generations had experienced economic, political, and social exclusion, just had a sense of anomaly characterized many among the working class. They were clear in their minds that the representative system that existed in most colonies 
was a representative system of the few. Very often we refer to that representative system as the old representative system, and I suspect that the word old is a, an appropriate um, descriptor of that, of that period. They were equally clear that the criminal justice system that had developed across the Caribbean existed more to criminalize the existence of the working class than to offer them equity and justice. Take, for example, the case of Jamaica and Belize. Of course, at the time that we were looking, we were looking there was no Belize as we know it. There was British Honduras. In Jamaica, as was the case in Barbados, the local elite had repeatedly passed legislation of the period from 1838 to the 1920s that restricted the access of the peasantry and the working classes to the franchise. In the excellent survey of the Jamaican historical experience, Philip Sherlock and Hazel Bennett, in their, their book, their, their survey, the story of the Jamaican people, chronicled the plight of the working classes and the peasantry when they state, and I think some of that will be on the, on the screen so you can follow as I, as I cite what they said. Referring to the peasantry and the working class, they, they tell us they could res, register to vote, and that should be if they, um, from, uh, forgive the, um, the, 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 the printer's devil, if, the, if their own real property worth six pounds or pay 30 pounds in rent or pay three pounds in direct taxes. Of course, for persons who might be getting a shilling, or maybe at most, two shillings at most, um, in terms of the, da of the daily wage, you can understand that this could create a very serious problem. By the middle of the 19th century, some 20,000 could have met these requirements. But under 3,000 registered to vote. The Baptist missionaries began a concerted effort to get small settlers to register. And, by, and, and that's in the earlier period. And by 1863, in one or two parishes, they made up as much as 63% of the voters list. They could not, however, exert much influence through the electoral process as the property clauses required a member of the assembly to have an annual income of, 100, of 300 pounds and unencumbered property worth 3,000 pounds. By the time we move to the 20th century, the situation is hardly changed. The franchise is a restrictive one, and certainly there's not much access. Although, um, in the research carried out by Swithin Wilmot of the University of West Indies, Mona Campus, um, there's a sense in which there is an attack on the, uh, on the oligarchic suppression um, through the vestry. And I want to suggest that the, um, the, um, the vestry has not been as, as properly studied as it might be, because it is in the vestry that we find a particular place in Jamaica and some of the other uh, charities where the Anglican Church is particularly strong, is in the vestry that we find some of the challenges, the, 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 the most vigorous challenges being posed by members of the working class. But up to the early 1920s, just on the eve of the, of the disturbances, if you may call them that, um, we have this restricted France, and that's Jamaica. If we look at the situation in British Honduras, this is again for, um, in, in the interest of, of, of trying to identify some pan Caribbean examples, workers there also fa face a restricted franchise. There, as late as 1936, voters had to receive an income of some 65 pounds per annum or to, rail, or to own rail property valued at about 104 pounds. To be a candidate for the House of Assembly, one had to have real property of 104 pounds or to have an annual income of about 210 pounds. Few workers or peasants could meet these requirements. In the case of the British Honduran workers, they were further hampered by an economic system in which workers were paid very low wages. That is also true of um, Jamaica, it is true of Trinidad, it is true of Grenada, it is true of wherever you go in the Caribbean, this is, a, this is a, a central issue. But in the case of Honduras, some of them received their pay in the formula, half in cash and the other half in rations. This system virtually one of debt peonage or debt peonage, sometimes referred to as a truck system, did not disappear until well into the 1940s. So to our brothers and sisters in, um, in, in British Honduras, 
um, again hampered by a very restrictive political system. And then when you tie that to the, to the, to the fact that the, the wages are extremely poor, and then worse yet, to the fact that some of them are not getting wages at all, but are rather getting some, some pittance, and then adding to that um, um, rations. When we look at these um, features, we begin to get a, a picture of the kind of environment in which um, political unrest might develop. Um, in places like um, British Rangers. Most of us would not have been familiar with, with this situation because the truck system did not exist in Barbados. However, um, Professor Wilbur Marshall has looked at the Metayar system or the Metairie system um, in the Wimwood Islands, and we know that in some of the Wimwood Islands, um, as a means of solving the, um, the problem of, of cash flow, some planters also worked out a system where um, the peasants, the workers, could um, work the land um, um, for, for share any profits. Um, I think in Barbados, some of that might have, um, might have come to us, gone down to us, in something called working for, or for the half. I don't know if anybody knows uh, that expression. Uh, very often it was, it was a matter of getting a cow or sheep or some other animal or working, working the ground for the half. Again, as we are informed by Nigel Bolland in his seminal work, The Politics of Labor in the British Caribbean, page 64, the situation in the British Leeward and Windward Islands reflected the same exclusion. In this subregion, there was a restrictive franchise that subjugated the interests of the masses to the wishes of a small mercantile elite. Even in British Guyana, where some reforms were attempted between the 1890s and the 1920s, the participation of the masses was woefully low. For example, as Bolland informs us, I don't know if this particular one is, on, is also on the screen. In 1915, and we're talking about British Guyana, when the electorate consisted of 4,312 people, 46.1% of the British adult males were registered as voters, compared to 17.7% of the Portuguese, 12.3% of Chinese, 6.8% of Africans, and worse yet, only 0.6% of the Indians, the East Indian uh, population. If the situation in the territories that we have identified might be considered backward, the situation in the Bahamas might, ha might have been even worse. For as late as 1945, there was resistance among the European elite to the inclusion of blacks and coloreds in the executive council. The situation is documented by Bridget Burton, who notes, the white power bloc objected to the admission of a colored member to the executive council, not only because it felt less free to express views on certain matters, but for purely social reasons. Governor Murphy in November 1945 submitted or admitted that if a colored man was appointed to the executive council, members of the white community became apprehensive that they and especially their wives might meet him and his wife at Government House. I wonder how, how they would have felt if they had seen the sight of the descendants of formerly enslaved people meeting the, um, the, the Earl and Countess just recently in Barbados at Government House. Notwithstanding the restrictive political systems that might have developed in the various colonies between the abolition of enslavement and the eve of the labor rebellions that struck the Caribbean in, over the 1930s, one might have excused the masses for having some hope that perhaps they might acquire the resources to effect the political representation that they desired. After all, the old representative system for all its flaws did have one possibility in the various clauses that were in place throughout the colonies. That is, if one could somehow acquire the required income, then a door might open that might permit some of the more, the, um, the, the more fortunate among the masses to enter the legislative assembly and effect the necessary reforms. But here again, the British colonial authorities, perhaps in a misplaced reforming zeal, had interfered in the political system at a time when even that possibility threatened to become a reality. And our analysis will show what happened at that time. Incidentally, if you're familiar with, uh, with Jamaican history, um, and you step back a bit, back to the 1830s, you might have known 
that the Jamaican House of Assembly was a rather, was a rather resistant House of Assembly. And when the British attempted to reform the prisons of Jamaica in 1838, the Jamaican Assembly went on strike because the British attempted to interfere in, in, uh, in, in, in managing the colony as such. And the British government um, asked the, um, the, the, and the Secretary in the, in the, um, of State in the Colonial Office to have a look at the matter and to advise. And he advised, um, Henry Taylor advised that they should abolish the, um, these assemblies in the Caribbean and have direct rule from, from, um, from, from England. But what happened was that um, they let the moment pass because um, they, they had a very narrow vote in the, in the in British Parliament and the government interpreted it more as a defeat than a victory and left the Jamaican Assembly for another few, another few years. In 1865, after the Morant Bay Rebellion in Jamaica, what happened is that now the opportunity came again, but this time the Jamaican House of Assembly voted itself out of existence. It is interesting to note at that time that several um, blacks and cutters had managed to acquire the necessary quali um, property qualification to begin to challenge the whites. There's a party called the Tongue Party in Jamaica that manages, manages to get a significant representation in the House of Assembly. So what I'm saying here is that the masses might have hoped that something could happen, that if, I acquire, if we acquire the necessary um, property, we can at least enter the House of Assembly. But in place of Jamaica and other, and, and shortly Caribbean, things are about to change. The British government is going to intervene. As I said just now, in the post-emancipation period, some black politicians did acquire the franchise, and some did enter the various assemblies. But the gradual installation of Crown Colony government, and that is the plan of the British government to, to achieve control, it is true that they wanted to achieve, um, to, to have more fiscal control. Uh, and, um, but the fact is that their intervention prevented the masses from advancing the revolution that they were at least attempting to achieve by that particular time. So the gradual installation of Crown Colony government in its various manifestations robbed the black masses of any hope that they could somehow conquer the political system. Whatever the form of Crown Colony government that has surfaced in the various colonies apart from Barbados, it was clear that the final decision making had effectively been handed to the executive. In some colonies, the elective principle um, had been abandoned almost totally. In others, the assembly had become partially elective. It, could, it would be the labor disturbances and rights of the 1930s that would press home the, the demand by the masses that the elective principles should be restored with an extended access to the franchise. Bolland's assessment of the situation is perhaps appropriate in assisting our understanding of the strictures that face the masses. He appoints, and I think that also should be on the screen. When examined in terms of constitutional forms, Barbados is at one extreme and Trinidad the other, with Jamaica and the other colonies moving from elected assemblies to crown colony regimes. In Trinidad, there was no elective principle. And in Jamaica, the oligarchy gave up its all political privileges in order to protect its property. That is the, the, um, the, the capitulation at the end of the Morant Bay Rebellion that I mentioned to you a few minutes ago. In Barbados, this was not necessary because the former, and this is, they use the word slaves, I would, I would say nowadays, the former and formerly enslaved. I am being politically correct because there's a new shift in the language. Anyhow, he says, um, because the former slaves remain so well regulated that the planters did not generally feel so threatened. In all cases, the property class maintained its political influence, generally supporting because it was supported by the representatives of the colonial office. These are some of the issues that you have to, you have to, you have to examine when you are beginning to understand what's happening in the Caribbean in the 1930s, the pan-Caribbean experience. Our discussion so far has attempted to survey the elements of Caribbean political systems that repress the legitimate expectations of the mass population. These elements thus underlie the explosion that we see in the 1930s and the early 1940s. Our attention now shifts <coughs> excuse me, to another issue that has not hitherto occupied much attention in the relevant literature on the disturbances. I refer here to the question of the place of the East Indian population in any discussion of the socio-political and economic issues that characterize some Caribbean colonies in the period under review. <clears throat> 
For our purposes, we look at the situation in British Guyana and Trinidad. And of course, we've chosen those territories because while their East Indian population is um, in Jamaica, while you have um, East Indian populations in some of the other or the Wimbledon Islands, some of the islands, um, the largest um, um, concentration of these populations were existed in Guyana and Trinidad. The East Indian workers suffered from severe maltreatment on the rural plantations where the bulk of them were located. The arrival of East Indians and to a lesser extent the Chinese generated serious conflict with the Afro-Creole workers. Many of the Afro-Creole workers view these indentured workers as scabs who will be imported to turn back the victories that have been won by the former. In the first years after emancipation, and again, you may not be familiar with, um, with, with um, the history of, of the indentured, the immigration of indentured um, workers from India and China, but you ought to be aware that in places like, like Trinidad and Guyana, um, shortly after emancipation, um, that the, the workers understood um, that the demand for labor gave them some advantages. And what the workers did is that they, they, put, up a, they put up a fight to maintain wage levels at a reasonably high rate. That's in 1842. So, so, so when the plans attempt, attempt to cut wages in British Guyana and in Trinidad in, the 18th, in 1842, the formerly enslaved people won the fight because they could resort to um, squatting on, on land, they could be, they can, uh, be develop their own peasant base operations, and, um, and, and through that means, um, get some relative independence from the estate labor market, and force the planters to offer them adequate wages to return to the estates. That was 1842. By 1848, the matter had changed totally, because with the importation of East Indian labor, what happened is that that led to an inflation in the labor market. And once the labor market was inflated, then the, when the formerly enslaved people tried, to, tried, tried to, to strike again, when they tried to challenge the oligarchy, plant the oligarchy, they lost. Um, it's a simple economic argument that whenever you have a surplus of labor and the demand for um, labor is, um, is, re is, re is relatively um, low, then you can push wages, you can push wages down. You swell the labor market, the demand suddenly um, shifts its focus, and you're able to cut and push wages down. So you can understand why some of the, um, the Afro, Afro Creole workers might have viewed this importation as being inimical to their interests, and why they might have viewed these people as scabs who were um, tools of the planter oligarchy. Clearly, the planters had imported these indentured laborers to provide a competition for labor that would force some Afro Creole workers back onto their estates and that would also drive wages downward. Conversely, as Selwyn Ryan observes, many Indian immigrants subscribe to the view that African Creoles were identified with the followers of Ramayan, the demon king of the Hindu Ramayan epic, and they feared that contact with Africans would be polluting. These mutual animosities then divided the migrants from the ex-enslaved population. And it is not surprising that the planters used this division to further suppress the laboring classes. Also, we might bear that this division, bear in mind that this division added to the pressure that the masses, both Afro-Creole and East Indian and others, were experiencing in the various societies. In the Trinidad case, the issues we have identified came to the fore in the 1920s, when the so-styled Wood Commission visited the country. This commission had been sent to the Caribbean by the colonial office to investigate social and economic conditions there. It is noteworthy that two groups of East Indians testified before the commission. As Ryan, Salwin Ryan, informs us, one of these, the East Indian National Congress supported some change in the electoral system, but argued that, quote, they will be swamped under a system of open electoral politics. Another group, which is not named, that was of East Indians, supported the status quo on the basis that the system of Crown Colony government, in which the governor nominated members of the Legislative Council, guaranteed some representation for East Indians. Given the lower educational status of the East Indian communities at that time, and the higher illiteracy that characterized such groups compared to the Afro-Creole population, 
they felt that their interests would be drowned under a much larger Afro-Trinidadian representation. Ryan also identifies a third group named the, as a Young Indian Party. This took a more radical stance than the other groups. Representatives of the Young Indian Party felt that reliance on a communal, communal Indian identity was a dead pass. They supported closing ranks with the blacks. However, their political platform had little in it to recommend it to the broad masses of the East Indian population. Indeed, and there, that should now be on the screen, the Indian masses, because the court did not respond readily to the argument that their welfare was intimately linked with the struggle of the blacks for democratic constitutional reforms. They deeply feared that these developments would undermine their growing economic and political strength and their cultural integrity. From the moment of their entry into the community's political life, the aim was to slow down for as long as possible the movement for radical constitutional change. And again, this is intended so that we can get a, a much wider picture of what's happening in the Caribbean, because if we're looking across the Caribbean, we must understand that there are subtle differences in, in terms of the population mix in our various territories, and there are subtle differences also in the political experience of our various um, Caribbean colonies at the time. The situation was hardly any different in British Guyana. There, there as Peter Ruhumon observes, by 1911, there were only 251 voters out of a total East Indian population of 126,517. However, just a few years later, in 1916, there was the formation of the British Guyana East Indian Association with its focus firmly fixed on East Indian matters. Why we should exercise some caution in assessing this reality through the lens of, the, of 21st century realities, we might note, however, that the plight of the working classes as a whole could hardly be relieved by such a myopic focus. As the East Indian population migrated out of the rural areas into the urban areas, it might, uh, might be observed that there was an increased potential for conflict with the Afro-Guyanese who were based in such areas. In this regard, we note the comment of Roy Glasgow who observes, the self-assertiveness of the rural Indians came into, account, sorry, into conflict with the established privileges of the urban sector. The African group with a tenuous hold on its economic stake in the country was opposed to another immigrant group overtaking it. The resulting struggle reflected the attempts of two differentiated cultural groups who were at the base of the social pyramid to forge ahead of each other. Again, on this question, Clem Cicheran's commentary on the evolution of the East Indian community in British Ghana exposes another aspect of the divide. In the early 1920s, some East Indian representatives proposed a colonization scheme to get more East Indians to migrate from India into Guyana. This immediately aroused intense opposition from blacks. The British Guyana Labor Union, led by the Afro-Creole of Barbadian origin, Hubert Crishaw, was vociferous in its opposition to this move. Perhaps Crishaw was a little too subjective in his response when in, in an address to what is called the Negro Progress um, Convention, he declared, people of our race um, try to do everything to pull the race down. They should sink their differences and get together so that other races should not laugh at them. In other words, as far as Hubert Crishaw was concerned, the interest of the, of the black masses was, was divergent from that of the East Indian uh, masses. The issue, as it was in Trinidad, was that the various working class groups faced the same enemies in the ruling oligarchy. The emphasis of the various groups on fighting their own racial battles only added to the pressure that all received. In considering then the factors that led to the outbreak of labor disturbances across the Caribbean, we, we, we reiterate that it is, it is important also to look closely at the racial divide that exists in some of the colonies between the various working class groups. Perhaps we might borrow from Nigel Bolland's assessment of the labor movement in British Guyana and Trinidad. He notes, again, it is available to you, both the BGLU, that's the British Guyana Labor Union, and the TWA, 
Trinidad Working Men's Association suffered from the fact that their members and support were drawn largely from the African segment of their respective societies. And they neglected to organize the Indians. Both had become less effective organizations by the late 1920s. So if you are trying to understand what is happening in the Caribbean, what are the forces that are driving um, across the Pan-Caribbean region um, towards, um, towards the struggle that we're going to see in the 1930s, part of our examination and analysis should be engaged in seeing what is happening on the ground, what is happening in the various populations. What is there that is adding to the tensions and pressures within the society? Because certainly these, these are ethnic tensions are part of the explanation, the social explanation for what is going to happen um, later. We are thus, by the analysis advanced here, closer to a better understanding of the forces that impacted on social action, <clears throat> as well as social formation in the Anglophone Caribbean, and therefore to a better understanding of the factors that led to the labor disturbances. Our attention now shifts to a discussion of the role of Marxist philosophies in the evolution of a response to the hegemony of the planted oligarchy. In this aspect of the discussion, I wish to state as an aside that as an adherent to a Judeo-Christian philosophy, which has its own dialectic, I am not a Marxist myself. However, as an historian, I appreciate that, that there are applications of Marxist philosophy that have relevance to an understanding of the class struggle that was represented in the labor disturbances in the Caribbean. And it would be almost a criminal neglect to bypass this issue in our discussion as well. Indeed, we might wish to note that in this contemporary period, when global capitalism is going through a crisis, some theorists are again resurrecting Marxian theory in predicting its demise. That's the demise of global capitalism. This much is apparent in the musings of Eric Hobsbawm, who is well known um, to those who understand these, these things. And there's an online review of his latest book, which is called How to Change the World, Tales of Marx and Marxism. And in that book, there is a, a bit of a, uh, and there's a, a review of this book, and I want to just share that with you, what, how, this, how the review views Hobsbawm and today's um, approaches. I'm only sharing this with you simply because I think um, we have to understand uh, the, and the value of other, what they call other lens through which we can um, see the action that's taking place at the period. But you can understand that if you also understand that today, right now as we speak, that there's that discussion that's going on across the world among intellectuals. And this is what this writer is saying about Hobsbawm. He says, perhaps even Hobsbawm, coolest and most judicious of analysts, is not wholly immune to this fever, talking about the fever of, that, that predicts the demise of capitalism, when he speculates that the financial collapse of 2008 may signal the beginning of the end of capitalism as we have known it. He certainly believes it marks the end of that 25-year period since the centenary of Marx's part death, during which Marx appeared to lose his relevance and for many of the younger generation, his interests. Once, he, once again, he announces with uncharacteristic downrightness the time has come to take Marx seriously. So for those of you who might be wondering what has Marx to do this, I'm saying again, is important to understand um, how uh, Marxist approach this issue. The person who's count this um, analysis of Hulkbaum, Stefan Colini, urges some caution, however, in predicting the death of capitalism. He observes, but what of the 21st century? From its beginnings in the 1840s, Marxism has been subject to fits of premature speculation. Marx and Engels repeatedly persuaded themselves and some others that the end of bourgeois society was nigh. And since Marx's death, there have been regular announcements of the crisis of capitalism. But each time the patient has somehow recovered and may even have grown stronger. We have to be very careful. And I'm only showing these things here again because we have to have some caution. While we are applying um, where the tools of analysis, <clears throat> we must not um, use them to predict anything um, beyond what they're able to predict. These brief remarks serve to point us in the right direction. Marxist analysis is a tool that has much to tell us about the world, about the changes of the world. However, like all tools, we have to be careful about making it do more than it's intended to. Having made these brief remarks about the utility of a Marxist 
or Marxian perspectives, it is useful, if only for the sake of our listeners here tonight, to say a little about this issue of dialectical materialism, which forms the core of Marxist analysis, and which is led to us by Marx and some of his collaborators. Just as a simplified way of looking at this issue, the term dialectics and its derivative dialectical simply refer to an argument or theoretical approach that views the world as essentially driven by contradictions that are arise over the material conditions of existence. Simply put, historical change follows certain laws and individuals are generally powerless to influence how these changes take place. Persons who adopt this view of history generally takes the, take the position that change takes place when two opposing forces, which are sometimes described as a thesis and antithesis, clash. Their opposition is only resolved by the action of a higher force, which is described as a synthesis. Hence the word synthesis also in, my, in, my, in the title of my lecture. When applied to capitalist society, the following scenario emerges. Capitalist society is divided into classes that are defined by their relationship to the means of production, namely capital and land. The class that owns or controls the means of production um, continues an inexorable movement towards expropriating more and more of these means of production. The resulting alienation eventually leads to the exploiting class, exploited class having only their labor power to sell. They increasingly see themselves then as a class with shared interests and engage in a violent struggle against their exploiters. The struggle is resolved when the ruling classes are overthrown and the working classes form a new society in which private property is abolished. That is, a, that is what we may call introduction to Marxist history, uh, politics and history lesson one, Marx 101. Let's move past that, however. Applied to the Caribbean situation, it is perhaps easy to see why some of the workers' representatives might have seen in the situation that faced their fellows echoes of a typical Marxian class struggle. Our attention thus immediately turns to two individuals who were more closely associated with the application of a Marxist perspective to the Caribbean struggle than perhaps any other persons. We take a brief look at the contribution of George Padmore and to a lesser extent, the contribution of C.L.A. James, because C.L.A. James' contribution comes later. And he is there at the time of Padmore, but his comes a little later. And I should uh, introduce him in here because um, he's an overlooked figure, and uh, also in a, a very often in an analysis of the issues that are coming to the fore during the labor rebellions of the 1930s. Incidentally, when I saw his name, I discovered, um, and you discovered too, that he was really born as Malcolm Nurse. So he's a nurse. But when you hear the name Padmore and you hear the name Nurse, you're thinking of some names that are quintessentially bar Barbadian. My own great grandfather came from the area by nearby Let Lears, nearby, uh, in fact, close to the turning, and he was a Padmore as well. And, uh, my, and, and, and my, my feeling is that this gentleman, George Padmore, who loomed large in the, um, in, in, in the Marxian, Marxist world, of the 1930s, that this gentleman um, that, um, picked the name, because I said his name was Malcolm Nurse, um, picked a name that was associated with one of the people that he knew from Barbados. His grandfather came from Barbados. His grandfather, a man called Hubert Alfonso, not a good major name, Hubert Alfonso Nurse. Grandfather migrated to Trinidad, and, 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 and thereafter, I said, uh, at some point in time, Malcolm Nurse changes his name and he becomes George Padmore. And, I, and I'm told um, I'm, I'm by Jerome Tillak Till Singh, who does research on this matter, that, um, that this better George, pa George Padmore was his friend. He had a friend called George Padmore. And I am convinced that he's really of, of Beijing origin. If you check most afro Trinidadians, particularly those people in the area of Lavantil and other areas of that kind, you'll find that most afro Trinidadians have a Barbadian background. Speak to them, they have a Barbadian grandfather, a great grandfather. So I wouldn't be surprised if it's George Padmore, um, is a, is a company Bell too. That's quite possible, right? The name Bell is a very important name. <laughs> Padmore was born in Barbados, sorry, in, in Trinidad, somewhere between 1902 and 1904. 
I have to say it between those years because the sources that I've looked at give me three dates for his birth. And, it, and what is strange is that in one book, um, all three dates are given. 1902, 1903, 1904. So sometime between 1902 and 1904, he is born. As I told you, he was christened as Malcolm Nurse and was the grandson of Hubert Alfonso Nurse, who had been enslaved on the Bell Plantation in Barbados and migrated to Trinidad possibly in the 1870s. And the reason why I can say that is that after this, getting this information, I went to the, a site called FamilySearch.org and looked for all the Hubert Alfonso Padmore's, sorry, nurses I could find, and I found that uh, the name surfaces largely around the 1870s. And I suspect that he probably moved to Trinidad around that time. Malcolm, later George Padmore, um, migrated to the USA in 1924, where he pursued studies at Fisk and then at Howard University. It appears that he became attracted to marxist leninist philosophies and joined the Communist Party in America in 1927. There, after he became the chief spokesman for the Communist International on Black Affairs. Um, this organization, the Communist International, was formed by the Communist Party in the Soviet Union in 1919 and became an important arm of their trust to overthrow the international bourgeoisie and to promote the spread of revolutionary movements across the world. Quite apart from his embrace of marxist leninist philosophy, Padmore was staunchly anti-colonial. I'm not saying that there's not a connection between the two things, but I'm saying I'm treating them separately. And also he was Pan-Africanist, and that is the part of the thing is particularly important. Indeed, as his Pan-Africanism, sorry, indeed his Pan-Africanism underlies his later break with, with the Comintern. That is the uh, name was applied to the Communist International. And he broke with them later on, and the issue that, on which he broke with them was largely tied to his espousal of a Pan-Africanist cause. Apart from Garvey, Padmore was perhaps the single most important promoter of black nationalism in the 20th, 20th century. Indeed, we might, we might take note of Ciela James's assertion in citing the eulogy of, of, um, of, 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 of President Nkrumah of Ghana on the event of, um, of, of Padmore's death. And this is what, and what, is what um, this is what Nkrumah said. Ja George Padmore was, in my view, one of the foremost fighters against colonialism of our modern times, that should be our. One day the whole of Africa will be free and united. And when the final tale is told, the significance of George Padmore's work will be revealed. That is a, um, a, 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 an unpublished work that, um, that Sierra James have begun, which looked at the life of, of George Padmore. Although George Padmore was a firm believer in the tenets of Marxian orthodoxy, He's a strong opposer of the blatant racism that characterized the American Communist Party and for that matter appeared in some of the views held by the Communist Party in, Mo in Moscow. C.L.A. James comments on this issue when he pens again. The complaints of George and most of the other Negroes, and I, that word Negroes of course dates the document that we're looking at, in the Communist Party in America and elsewhere in those days was that the communist leaders would never seem to understand that the Negro question had racial connotations. In other words, the Europeans in Russia and the Soviet Union really had no understanding of what our people were facing. They hadn't been in that experience and therefore when it came to analyzing what was happening in the Caribbean, they, 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 they missed the boat. And George Padmore recognized that at some point. It is not intended here to do a full biographical survey of Padmore's life. In any case, there are others far more qualified than I am to undertake that task. And I want to thank Dr. Rodney Worrell, um, who is a colleague at the University of West Indies, for his fraternal response in lending me some of the, his treasured documents. Of course, I knew Padmore's contribution, but not as much as I should have known. So as I was preparing for the lecture, I said, let, let me get to know a bit more. And um, Dr. Worrell lent me his, um, his very treasured documents, some um, which are very rare, very difficult to get hold of. However, in sharing some of these vignettes on Padmore's life with you, it is intended here to widen our understanding of some of the influences which are part of the tapestry of the labor disturbances across the Caribbean in this period under study. For our purposes, it is, it is Padmore's role as an educator, an agitator, 
and a revolutionary thinker that impacts heavily on an emerging leadership of the labor movement across the West Indies. Again, we turn to C.L.R. James, who spent much time with Padmore, particularly after his break with Moscow, and who was able to chronicle many of the important moments in Padmore's life. James informs us that what Padmore did between 1930 and 1935 was to organize and educate the Negro masses, and that's, not, that, that's across the world, that's across the diaspora, on a world scale on the theory and practice of modern political parties and modern trade unions, right? Here James points to Padmore's pivotal role as a representative of the Comintern and of its Moscow leadership. Under the auspices of the Comintern, Padmore was the chief organizer of a major international conference of black labor activists. We are again informed by James that he used all kinds of intrigue to sneak several of the delegates past the watching eyes of various European police forces into Hamburg, Germany, where this conference was being held. One of the largest and one of the first of the major, what they call, pan-Africanist conferences that you could have. But this was done under the auspices of the of Comintern. The conference that convened in Hamburg Germany in July 1930 marked one of the finest hours in the Pan-Africanist movement. But don't let's take it, um, don't let's take our own words. Let us see what Padmore himself said about the conference. In his own words, in, the, uh, in a book called The Life and Struggles of the Negro Toilers. Incidentally, when I see him talk about Negro Toilers, I, I, I understand why he turned on as Toilers because there's a big debate going on even then about the development of what they call a working class in a pre-industrial society. But don't let's get, don't let's get into that. That's a, that's a debate altogether. What is important here is what he says about that conference. Let's read it. This was the first international conference of Negro workers which had ever been convened. At this conference, Negro delegates from different parts of Africa, the United States, West Indies, and Latin America not only discussed trade union questions, but dealt with the most vital problems affecting their social and political conditions. And of course, the book is on there, the source. If you're interested in that source, you can make note of it um, because you might want that extra reading um, that help you understand it. The West Indian activists who were present at the conference are not identified. But the fact that they are mentioned at all points to a deeper connection between Padmore and the Caribbean cause than might have been immediately apparent. Padmore was appointed head of a branch of the Red International of Labor, Labor Unions, RILU, known as the International Trade Union Committee of Negro Workers. This committee also launched a monthly periodical called The Negro Worker, of which Padmore himself served as editor for three years. The data show that authorities in the Caribbean were deeply suspicious of um, the subver subver subversive potential of this publication, The Negro Worker. Indeed, various governors commenting on such publications in the dispatches to the colonial office spoke of its, of its subversive nature and associated, associated with Bolshevik intrigue. David Brown, in his very recent publication, and I would urge you to, when, it, when it's launched, that you, you, you purchase a copy, Race, Class, Politics, and the Struggle for Empowering in Barbados, 1940 to 1937, notes on page 84 of that book, that while it is difficult to ascertain the extent to which such literature was distributed or circulated, the literature was cited by various activist groups during their campaigns. We might also bear in mind the comments made by, by, uh, by, by, by C.L.R. James, also cited by Jerome Tilak Singh, in an, in an article called The Immortal Batsman, George Padmore, the revolutionary writer and activist, which is found in another book that you should make a, a, a necessary item of your library. The book is called George Padmore, Pan-African Revolutionary, and is edited by Fitzroy Baptiste, the late Fitzroy Baptiste, and Rupert Lewis. It's published by Ian Randall Publishers in 2009. And this is what is said. There. And this is a quote we're using James, but, uh, but um, I, the quote in Tiluxin's work is short by a couple of lines, and I picked the other lines from, from, Padmore, from Sierra James's own um, summary on, on Padmore. This is what it says. While the educated in Trinidad, to take an immediate example, 
were sunk in the acceptance of the ideas inculcated by British imperialism, Uriah Butler and the workers in the Trinidad oil fields were nourishing themselves on illicit copies of the Negro worker and preparing the great outburst which was to launch the new West Indies upon paths of nationalism and democracy. So if you ask me how does um, Padmore impact through his writing, through his tutelage of, 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 um, of the emerging um, black leadership in the Caribbean, the, the literature is going around, the fellas are reading it, and as they read the literature, it's, it's impacting on their reaction to the plan to oligarchy. Equally important in this discussion of a possible link between the espousal of Marxist philosophies and the outbreak of labor disturbances is James's observation that, quote again, communism in theory and the concrete idea of Russia as a great power, which is on the side of the oppressed, this is what the Negro worker gave to the sweating and struggling thousands in the West Indies. As a postscript to Padmore's contribution to the Pan-African and Pan-Caribbean movement, labor movement, we are again not intended to paint him as a faultless messiah. Before he crystallized his Pan-Africanist thought, <clears throat> and we formulated it outside of an orthodoxy imposed by the common turn, he was vigorously opposed to Garvey's movement, which we'll also briefly examine in our survey. In his book, the same book, The Life and Struggle of Negro Toil, this is what Padmore wrote about, about Garvey. And I just want to share it with you because I, I just want to see the other side uh, of him. At a time when he is, uh, when he is um, still in the clutches of the, of the common turn, he doesn't see Garvey's movement as, as a legitimate movement. He sees it more as an obstacle um, to revolutionary consciousness. And this is what he says. The struggle against Garveyism represents one of the major tasks of Negro toilers in America and the African and West Indian colonies. Why must we struggle against Garveyism? He asked the question. As the program of the Communist International Correct States, and notice, notice who, he, who he is citing, Garveyism is a dangerous ideology which bears not a single democratic trait and which toys with the autocratic attributes of a non existent Negro kingdom. It must be strongly resisted, for it is not a help but a hindrance to the mass Negro struggle for liberation against American imperialism. And I thought I had to put that in here because I wanted to see the contradictions that were, that were wrong at the time. But, so on the one hand, you have Padmore's contribution. But one, in hindsight, wonders um, how much more value might have been given to, um, to the struggle if there had been, an, uh, if there had been a, a, a link between Padmore and, Padm uh, and, and Garvey at the right time. One wonders about that. Of course, um, as I said earlier, we must also be aware that the forces of reaction were not far behind either. So perhaps had the two of them uh, formed that kind of um, alliance, we might have had a greater suppression of the movement as well too, but that's just something you need to bear in mind. The content of the statement we've just read reveals its provenance. It was unfortunate, unfortunate that the struggle for black liberation should have been divided between the ideology of black nationalism exposed by Garvey and the internationalism of the workers' cause exposed by Padmore's Moscow backers of the time. It is to Padmore's credit that he saw how ludicrous was the situation that sought to sideline the struggle against racism. In any case, once he was freed from his internationalist limitations, Padmore could more easily support the cause of transnational black liberation. And we find him, uh, once he goes to England, because he eventually goes to England, that he's urging the British Labour Party and the Labour Movement in general, in Britain at large, to support the cause of black workers in Jamaica. And this is a time, not too long before the, uh, comment, the, the commentary has, has told him to, to suppress some of the discussion um, that he was having about uh, liberation and decolonization because they want to further other aims. This is what he says um, in 1938, however. It is high time for a fundamental change in the political consciousness of the colonies along the road to self-determination. It is the duty of Negroes in America 
West Indies in particular, to help the islanders in their struggles for better economic, social, and political conditions. So we've seen that he came full circle. Padmore's contribution overshadows that of C.L.R. James. However, in our attempt to uncover the various elements that contribute to the consciousness of the masses and the emerging labor leadership, it would be a mistake to omit any mention of, of James. James's own contrib contribution, um, some at a deeper philosoph philosophical level, uh, extends beyond the 1930s into the post disturbance period. His was a continuous search for the relevance of Marxist theorizing to the Caribbean situation. And his book, The Black Jacobins, is a fine example of that search. Here was a masterful attempt to apply Marxian theories about class struggle in an industrial setting to a slave society where, according to classical Marxist theory, such a struggle did not fit. However, you must also see him as working with Padmore to challenge the oligarchic backwardness of early 20th century Caribbean society. He was a participant observer with Padmore in the International African Service Bureau that had been formed by the latter, that's by Padmore. He had also served as editor to the journal of that organization, the International African Opinion. Thus, we may picture the two men, one more prominent and the other in the struggle, as assisting in the creation of a matrix of information that will help to crystallize the thinking of the emerging leaders of the labor movement in the Caribbean. Against that background then, we turn our focus to that giant of the 1920s and 30s Caribbean, Marcus Mosiah Garvey and his UNIA. The impact of Garveyism on Caribbean societies in the review period is better understood when the context in which Garvey emerges is factored into the analysis. We have already identified the political landscape that restricted the working classes. Additionally, there was a virtual apartheid that relegated the masses to the slums and ghettos of the urban areas, to tenantries and poorly serviced villages in the rural context. To that scenario, we need to add the question of low wages, or at the very least, inequitable wage systems, and legal restrictions, which I've pointed out before, all, all but criminalize the commercial activity of the working classes. To this, we may also add the effect of a psychological implosion that contributed to a self-hatred among many non-Europeans and to a denigration of the achievements of the various ethnic groups that constituted the, um, the lower echelon of Caribbean societies. Against this background, the appearance of Garvey on the Caribbean and world stage was nothing short of amazing. Yet we must bear in mind that Garvey was not the first to push for a resurgence of pride in African achievement. He was preceded by scholars such as J.J. Thomas, and that's another name we should be familiar with, whose book, Fraudacity, was a resounding challenge to the thesis of black inferiority held by most white intellectuals of the time. And in fact, in case you, you don't know, um, there's a, 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 I think he is um, Anthony Fraud, who is a registered scholar at one of the leading British universities, comes to the Caribbean in the late 19th century, and as he goes through the Caribbean, he opines that, um, that the Caribbean people are like children and that they needed English civilization to be anybody at all, that they couldn't think for themselves and they had to be led. And it was then that J.J. Thomas wrote his book, Fraudacity, to let Fraud know that um, there was another analysis that could be applied and that should be applied. So he had J.J. Thomas. Another person who, who um, preceded um, Garvey was Edward Wilmot Blyden, another very important name in the Pan-African struggle, who developed an Afrocentric and black nationalist philosophy that sought to invoke the pride of the African diaspora in the achievement of African civilizations. In that regard, this is talking about Edward Wilmot Blyden, he asserted that much of European philosophy and achievement was derived from earlier contact with African civilizations. Thus he affirmed, as summarized by one scholar, that, and this, and this is by Dennis Ben, another book which I consider required reading, and I would urge you to get hold of a copy if you can. The book by Dennis Ben is called The Caribbean and Intellectual History, 1774 to 2003. It is published by Ian Randall, 
publishers in 2004, and I suggest you should get it. It has a wealth of information on various um, Caribbean intellectuals. But this is what Bladen said. This is a one liner here. In the realm of civilization and culture, Greece sat at the feet of Egypt. That's a profound statement. It's saying that, um, that the Greek that the, um, that civilization that we, that we admire so much, that that Greek civilization required a lot of its ethos, a lot of its philosophy from, 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 from Africa. And in case you, you think that, uh, that Egypt is, um, is anything other than African, you need to take a good look at some of the art in the pyramids and look at the Nubians and the other groups um, who are a picture there. He is also needs to be aware that Pharaoh Ramesses, Ramesses II and some of the pharaohs of Egypt were tremendous figures who had really tremendous power in the region. And then if you want to get a little more on that, you should need to look at the, um, at the work of Diop, who has examined some of the mummies um, in Egypt, got some samples of their skins, and discovered that in their skins, you have some melanin in their skins. And I want to let you know, um, that this is, again, as an aside, and this is, I, I have respect for our, our, what we call the, the, the European element of our Barbadian population. I understand that we have, some of us have had some hard struggles. But I want to let you know that um, one of the things that, is a, that I consider to be a special blessing, and here's the Jew, the question to me now, is this melanin here? This is special. And whenever I see it, I say, bro, BJ, too sweet. <laughs> too sweet. Nothing wrong with this at all. So Greek philosophy, much of Greek philosophy came from, from the Africans. Quite apart from these antecedents, we may also wish to be aware that in the Francophone Caribbean, there's a parallel movement somewhat later than Garvey's initial contribution, but accompanying it in its later manifestations known as Negritude. The two names most associated with the Negritude movement are Emile Césaire, the Martinican born Pan Africanist, and the other name is Lepole Senghor, the Senegalese scholar who later became the president of Senegal. An extract from one of Césaire's works penned in the later 1930s alerts us as to the content of his philosophy. Let's look at that on the board. And this is, how, this is Césaire's words. My negritude is not a stone, nor a deafness flung against the clamor of the day. My negritude is not a white speck of dead water on the dead eye of the earth. My negritude is neither tower nor cathedral. It plunges into the red flesh of the soil. It plunges into the blazing flesh of the day. And my negritude riddles with holes the death affliction of its worthy um, patience. Tremendous um, discussion on the philosophy of, um, of what we call of African pride. This is from Césaire. We may also get a, a, a brief glimpse into the philosophy of negritude held by Senghor in the following. Negritude is neither racialism nor self-negation. Yet it is not just affirmation, it is rooting itself in, in oneself, that should be oneself, and self-confirmation. Confirmation of one's being is nothing more or less than what some English-speaking Africans have called the African personality. It's a question of self-discovery. That's, that's what, um, that's what Senghor and Césaire uh, were, were, were expounding. But I just mention it because, again, to get a, a, a comprehensive view of, of, um, of Garveyism, to get a comprehensive view of what has happened at the time, you ought to be aware of what's happening, not only in, in, in the speaking Caribbean, but outside of it, in the Francophone Caribbean as well. There's some debate over whether the negritude movement is essentially moderate when compared to the Garveyite movement. But the resolution of that debate is beyond the scope of this lecture. I have simply identified this development to illustrate the point that Gary's contribution was perhaps, perhaps the, most, the more pervasive and widespread. We must not be oblivious, though, to the presence that while it was more pervasive and widespread, we must not be oblivious, oblivious to the impact of other thinkers and pioneers in the struggle. Born in 1887 in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica, Garvey experienced the instances of racial prejudice that were common to all Caribbean societies. It appears that he had a strong association with Robert Love. That's another name in Caribbean history that we should be familiar with. Robert Love is, again, another black pioneer, newspaper writer, editor, um, living in Jamaica. And it's interesting that you see a lot of the Caribbean radicals, a lot of them were writing, and that is what, how they're disseminating their thoughts and ideas. 
um, in that group you can put um, Wickham. And earlier than that, you had um, Samuel Jackman Prescott. A number of them, the same Marcus Mosel Garvey, you, when you look at them, many of them were connected with the, with the media. They're, 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 they're newspaper person, they're writing articles, they're, they're circulating their writings. So he had his early associates with Robert Love who, who um, influenced him. Um, he, he was also um, a member of a club in Jamaica called the National Club of Jamaica whose founder was a decided anti-colonialist. Anti so long before Garvey appears on the world scene, there are influences on his life in Jamaica that are preparing the way for this colossus um, to have its impact on Caribbean society. Between 1909 and 1914, Garvey travels through several countries in Latin America and then to Britain, acquiring the information and experience which should be crystallized on his return to Jamaica in 1914. And when he returns, he forms the and listen to the um, first title for us, Universal Negro Improvement and Conservation Association, that's what it begins as, and the African Communities League, a very long title. It later became known as United Negro, uh, or Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA. In 1918, Garvey launches the Negro World, which publication quickly gained a following throughout the um, African diaspora in North America, the Caribbean and Africa itself. Its reach was so pervasive that as Sherlock and Bennett in the story of Jamaican people, page 302 tell us, it was banned at different times in almost every colonial country in Central America, the West Indies and Africa. That's how far the thing went. Gary's message was taken across the African diaspora by activists and by black sailors. Soon there were branches of the UNA in South Africa and in practically every other African country, Francophone, Anglophone, and in every country of the Caribbean. Some of our people who eventually turned up in the disturbances in Barbados first met Garveyism, not in Barbados, they met him in, met him in Panama. Some met, some met Garveyism in Costa Rica. Many of our ancestors went to Costa Rica. They met him in, met him in Nicaragua. They met him in Cuba. Wherever you went, Gabby, Gabby loomed large. We do not intend here to restate the fortunes of Gabby and in particular his betrayal in the USA. It is sufficient to note that his hand can be felt everywhere throughout the Caribbean, where disturbances broke out in the 1920s and in the 1930s and beyond. In his excellent work, Glenford Howe, and this work is called Race, War, and Nationalism, a Social History of West Indians in the First World War, another book that you should have in your library. In that book, how notes that returning soldiers come out of the First World War, this before the 1930s, angered by the blatant racism shown to them by military and civilian authorities, invoked Gaviate connections when they fomented civil unrest in each port that they, that they entered on their return. The British authorities were afraid of them because there had been a mutiny in, in, um, in, in Europe, things place, things place called Toronto. And as a result of that mutiny, they watched all the soldiers, but the soldiers were imbued with, uh, with the spirit given to them by Garvey. And whenever they came back, they, they would brook no nonsense. So as once they arrived in any port and there was any trouble, any, any discrimination, the fellows were ready to, 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 to fix it. And Garvey was the, was the catalyst. Garvey was the, the single word that you'll find that, that will be there. Nigel Bolland's comprehensive survey of the labor movement in the Caribbean discovers the influence of Garvey in several of the disturbances that took place in the 1930s. We find him in British Honduras. We find the influence in Trinidad. We find it in Jamaica. We find it in Grenada. We find him in Barbados, where, as David Brown's research shows, there were several branches of the UNIA <clears throat> and several of the activists involved in the 1930s disturbances were or had been members of the UNIA. Wherever you go in the Caribbean, most of the black leaders of the labor movement, the pan-Caribbean movement, most of them had either been Garviettes before or had some connection in the movement. Some of them were members of two organizations. You'll find them as a member of, the, of a working men's association and also a Garviette. If you look at any rats, men that you think um, Israel Lovell, uh, men of that kind of thing, is there, is there a grant too? Um, right. 
Yes, when you look at all the Gavites, a lot of them got the first connection with Gavi in uh, his movement in, I said, in, in South America. Went back to Barbados and other ways. Again, we note that in any survey of the pan Caribbean disturbances, the influence of Gavi must be one of the factors to be given a high priority. So now, as we, as we get closer to the last lap, with the considerations that I've shared with you tonight in mind, we can now begin to summarize very briefly the course of the disturbances and to identify a few other factors that will be part of the synthesis of issues that contributed to the actions that we're looking at. <clears throat> the table that I have, and I trust that we can get it, is a Word document, but just very briefly, it helps to summarize some of the major actions and some of the, um, the, the persons who are involved. In Antigua, you have the um, strikes in the Sugar Belt, 1933, 1939, and the name associated with the Antigua Labour Movement is a man called Harold Wilson. This is not the British Prime Minister of years ago. And a man called Reginald Stevens, and the two other names, Norris Allen and Veer Bird of, Anti of, of the Antigua Trades and Labour Union, which followed the Antigua Working Men's Association. In many of the Caribbean territories, Breast prior to the outbreak of strikes and rebellion or disturbances, you find that there's the organization of a labor movement. And many of them are called working men's associations. You had them in Barbados too. Because even the Barbados uh, disturbances, you cannot ignore the influence of the Democratic League led by, Char uh, by Charles Duncan O'Neill. And, you, and, and, um, and, and, you, and you, you can't ignore um, his working men's association from in 1926. These associations had to mobilize um, mass support. I had to build the consciousness of the masses. In British Honduras, which we then became Belize, there are strikes and disturbances with some violence on both sides, that is, the workers um, hitting back and the authorities trying to suppress them with violence. And the names associated are people like Antonio Soberanis Gomez and Arti Mehan. And, uh, and the union that is, is formed is the British Honduras Workers and Tradesmen Union. In British Guyana, there are strikes and disturbances in the Sugar Belt and on the docks, with some violence on both sides. And, this, and the disturbances on the plantations, like Plantation Leonora, are also involved East Indians. So what I said earlier, that there's this divide, in the 1930s, East Indians are now finding their voices in terms of the mass struggle. There have been some struggle before, but now the thing seems to be coming to the boil. But the name associated with the labor movement in Guyana, of course, is Hubert Critchlow. And again, I said, this is a Barbadian name. Incidentally, when you go through the Caribbean and look at a lot of the leadership of the, of the early movement, a lot of the fellows who are the major leaders are, are Barbadians who migrated. It happens in Suriname, it happens in Guyana, it happens in the Northern Caribbean. Very frequently, it does what happens. Barbados, of course, you know, um, the names, and I just cited a few names, but there are many more. I just cited Clement Payne, Grant is 11, and Grant the Adams, not in any particular order. Um, the other names, a lot of other names, but we can't include all of them here. And the disturbances include strikes, raids on provision grounds, attacks on property with some violent reaction by the police, of course. Sinkets, strikes and disturbances in 1935. J. Matthew Sebastian and J. N. Nathan, the names associated with that struggle. St. Vincent, you have strikes and disturbances again in 1935. George McIntosh and Ebenezer Duncan, and um, he, they belong to the St. Vincent Representative Government Association, and later the St. Vincent, that should be working men's. I, I, I wrote that very quickly so you understand when you're waiting on the last lap. Some, sometimes your eyes don't uh, see as clear as when you're starting. Then you have. Um, the Bahamas, the Reds in Nassau, in the, the Bahamas is really a more, more and more laid back of the societies. 1942, really, they, they come late. There's some, some little problems before, but 1942, and the, uh, the source, so I've been trying to get, collect the source on that, um, but um, oh my, I'm trying to remember my colleague from Bahamas, um, oh my, my, my mind is gone on that point. Anyhow, there's a, an, an interesting history on the, on the Bahamas, uh, Gail, Gail Saunders. That, that's, that's the person who wrote that. And there's a, one leader who's identified, and he's a white Bahamian. Um, a lot of Americans moved to the Bahamas in the 1930s lot, and the 1940s. 
and some of these Americans who come are working class Americans, and they bring some, some, some contact with labor organization. Trinidad, of course, you know, I didn't put the date there, but 90, again, 1934, 1938, um, um, and the names associated with that are Arturo Cipriani, again, the Trinidad Working Men's Association, Adrian Cola Rienzi of the Trinidad Citizens League, and there are a lot of others that we can't uh, fill into this. Then in Jamaica, you have strikes and disturbances, 1935. You have Alan Coombs, you, you uh, Buchanan, William Alexander Bustamante, and you should be aware that that was not his real name. He, he, he called himself at one time Alejandro Bustamante. And, I, and with, with deference to any of my Jamaican friends who may be here, I suspect that he was trying to escape some of the more obvious um, racial uh, repression that he would have got as a member of the mixed community. But by going abroad and pretending to be a Latin American, as they were, and he could pass that with shock of white hair and his complexion, he could escape some of the uh, more obvious racist attacks. But he came back, got involved in the labor movement. St. Lucia, I have not been able to discover yet who is the major person who is um, involved in this. But, um, but the, I find that a lot of agitators from Barbados, Trinidad, um, one figure who looms large through the Wimbledon and Leeward Islands is a man called Marishaw. I think that name should be familiar to you. Marishaw goes through all the islands of the, of, of the, uh, in the, in the smaller islands of the Caribbean and he spreads the word. So you can't, you can't miss his hand there. Finally, I said it's the last lap. And I know, because I know the time is getting away. As we look across the Caribbean, we see a commonality of issues. Many of the strikes and disturbances are begun in the context of a working class suffering under the pressure of low wage regimes in a time of the Great Depression, a time when sugar prices are also falling on the world sugar market. This is also a time when some 90 years after emancipation, some Caribbean colonies have political systems that effectively bar the masses from participation in the political process, either as voters or members of assemblies. This is also a time when the emerging leadership of the labor movement is benefiting from increased contact with a wider world of knowledge, a knowledge that is facilitated by the technology of travel and communications. People are in contact with brothers and sisters in Africa, India, Europe, and North America. This is also a time when there is an increased awareness of the achievements of the Soviet Union as a major competitor with the USA and as an alternative to cap capitalist oppression. It is also a time when there had been some reform in Britain and there is a rise of the Labour Party and the trade union movement in England. Into this volatile mix that I've been identifying, we saw the catalyst of Pan-Africanism and Garveyism and the ingredients are there for an explosion. In all of this, we must not be quick to see the disturbances as a spontaneous reaction to local conditions alone. Rather, we must see the purposefulness of a mass population aware of the same issues and determined to challenge the oligarchy in a meaningful way for their place in the sun. I thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks very much to Professor Pedro Welch for uh, extensive treatment of the synthesis of the historical factors impacting on the, as a result of the British and impacting on the British lip, Caribbean labor rebellions. So I think it was a very great effort tonight. Should probably applaud him again. Mm -hmm. As is normal, we open the, to the floor for some questions to the lecturer, and I await your interest. Any questions? Yeah, there are mics in the center. Yes, you can come to the mic. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Dr. Welsh. That was a, a very wide-ranging and comprehensive um, expose of the subject. I just have one little problem, though. 
it's well known that women in were working class women were very much part of the workforce in the um, in in the West Indies at that time. Now I can think of names like um, Amy Garvey, Nellie Weeks, and um, perhaps some little lady called Audrey Jeffers. But what's apart from that? I mean, you didn't see any of these people as particularly sort of relevant to or Im important enough anyway to to talk about tonight. But I wondered, is the, was this because women were not encouraged to be involved in these um, organizations? I mean, the word, the, the name Working Men's Association, for example, will put, put me off. I mean, would they want me to join or would it be a case of um, uh, was I welcome to join sort of thing? Um, I just wondered if you could perhaps um, sort of comment on that area. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, thank you very much for the question. It, um, it really um, might be considered an omission on my part um, in looking up with the whole question of, of women's organizations, the women's movement. Um, the fact is that you'll find that um, in terms of the documentation, let me begin there. In terms of the documentation, I'm, I'm not suggesting by any means that you can't find some of the information, but the documentation is thin and weak on the question of women's participation in the political process. I know, for example, that in the area of, that in the case of, um, of British Honduras, that, the, that women were over here to be saying that if the men don't challenge the um, people, the men are cowards, and that they're willing to take on the struggle themselves. So we have, throughout the history of, um, of the labor movement, the, the, the pictures of, of women's involvement. And we can sometimes identify that women's involvement by looking at those who are arrested, for whatever reason, look at lists of those who are arrested, so we find women present in those lists. That's one way of, of uncovering women's um, um, participation. In some cases, women are members of, of institutions and organizations. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that, um, that uh, let me move on to the Caribbean a bit. I'm aware that women, black women in particular, were very heavily involved in the, in the Communist Party in the USA and were contemporaries of Pat Moore and that you have some of, those, some of those women who also come to the Caribbean. There's no doubt in my mind that you do have that, co that, um, that contribution. As I said much of it is not documented um, in the secondary sources that I've seen and even some of the primary sources, but the presence is there. And, uh, and, 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 we, and, we need, and we need also to include those. I suspect that what this is really saying is that some of our researchers and historians, and I think you're well qualified to, to, to carry the job yourself, um, I wish to, um, to, to, to dig a little more deeply into this question of women's involvement. The time is right now for that kind of thing. And I suspect that you might find that even though um, our population is aging, um, there are persons around who can give you some of the oral history um, um, approaches. I think um, David Brown in his own research on the UNIA um, could identify a few women who um, house the UNIA meetings in their houses and that kind of thing. So uh, there's information. So thanks again um, for the question because it reminds us that of our need uh, to fill the gap. Uh, thank you, Dr. Welsh. Uh, it was a pleasure to sit here and listen to you. I have a comment and a couple of questions to ask. Uh, first of all, uh, I grew up in New York, and I went to the Jeff School, and I thought I knew all about Marxism, but you brought to light some things I was never aware of. And it makes me, uh, it reminds me of the fact that um, <clears throat> I worked many years ago with someone who was considered uh, very knowledgeable, and that person's name was uh, Leopold Stokowski. And I worked with him when he was 91. And I remember he said to us, you're never too old to learn something new. And I say that tonight, that I've learned something new. Uh, I want to know, have you ever heard the name of Hubert Humphrey? Uh, he was supposed to be, uh, I, think, uh, I think he was a contemporary of Garvey. Yes. And, but, did, and, and I just want and one other question. Yes. I wonder if the downfall of Russia had to do with the fact that the imperialists realized, because you said something to the fact that Russia had some relationship to the black struggle in the Caribbean. And I wonder if this is why 
there was such an attack on Russia because they were afraid that there might have been some kind of allegiance there and that they would all fight against the capitalists and the imperialists. Those are my two questions. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, certainly questionable. Um, Humphrey, um, your name appears um, in some of the discussions about the, um, the black, the, what they call the movement, in, what's called the Harlem Renaissance. I think that, that, that's, that's one of the areas where the Humphrey name appears. Um, they're, they're, they're also, also, if there are a lot of activists whose names are not as well known as Padmore and some of the others. We mentioned Padmore because of his very pervasive influence. Um, we, we do know that um, if you go to, um, in, into the USA, into the area of Harlem, um, there's that library, I'm trying to remember the name of the gentleman who, who gave his name to the library in, in Harlem, um, the Schomburg, Schomburg Center, where, um, the, where the, the collections of, of, of documents you know, documenting the, the, the black struggle. Um, a lot of the person who I have not mentioned tonight can be found there. Um, when it comes to um, the question of, of the Soviet Union and whether the, uh, I couldn't answer that question because I am not really an expert on the question of the, imperial, in, in the imperialist um, struggle um, to suppress the, the um, Soviet Union. Um, most of that struggle is an ongoing struggle that begins from the time of the Bolshevik Revolution and continues. Um, the, during the, the Second World War, um, one of the, um, the objectives of Hitler's forces, uh, particularly under Operation Barbarossa, was to completely obliterate the um, Soviet Union because the Soviet Union was considered to be a, a, what we call a, a competitor um, for world domination. Um, and then um, subsequent to that, of course, you are aware that, um, that the United States of America itself and other Western powers um, did all in their power over the years to, to, um, to, to demonize um, the Soviet Union and its operations. And part of the implosion of the Soviet Union also has to do with the pressure that is, um, was launched from outside. At the same time, while we're saying that, we, we mustn't also ignore the fact that there were contradictions in the Soviet Union itself. So that some of the disintegration of the Soviet Union has to do with contradictions within. And when those contradictions became too, too, um, too hard to bear, the masses themselves um, put enough pressure on the system that over time the system um, uh, uh, imploded. Um, if you look at the experience of Cuba, you realize that um, the Cubans have seen that lesson and have learned from it. Uh, and, and, and therefore, ex I expect very shortly under the current Castro that you're going to find some, what we call some reforms taking place, uh, which will help to preserve the regime. Because without those reforms, the same implosion Will, will, will might take place. Um, you see, in, even even in um, even in in, um, in communist countries, um, there are some contradictions. And sometimes those who occupy the high seats in Politburo, the ones who get the vacations, and, and the spas, and the black sea, or wherever it is, and once people around the working class see that contradiction, they have a problem. But this is early days yet. I don't know what's going to happen in the world. Early days yet, I don't know. I know we are looking at Marx again. It's quite possible that Marx may have more to say to us about our current society. So who knows? I don't know. <laughs> Any further questions? Okay, uh, Trevor usually comes at the end, right? Not at all. <laughs> no, not necessarily. Good evening, sir. Came evening. late and probably missed a lot of. Oh, thank you, Professor Welch, for. Yes, usually competent, highly competent, erudite uh, disquisition. Um, a number of little points and then a question. One about the women. Um, I think Pat asked about the women, and I think that um, Susan Craig did yeah. some work on that. But there's still a lot of work to be done on women in these various societies, even in Barbados with mm -hmm. Alexandrine Manning, Manning and Gibbs. Yes. And we have, I have a bit of research done and looking at the Democratic League. Some of the women in the Democratic League were in the forefront of uh, storming the barricades, as it were, um, in the 1937. Mm -hmm. You had also in Jamaica Gladys Longbridge, mm -hmm. Bustamante's secretary who became yeah. his wife. You also yes, had yes, yes. Elma Francois in mm -hmm. Trinidad extremely serious woman, St. Vincent, Vincentian born, etc. So the, some of these women, some of the women were even more serious than the men. Um, one question is, you're looking at 1934 from 
Soberanis in Belize, right down to 39 in Leonora in British Guyana. And I know you, the two things which emerge. One, is there any connection between the, the Clement Pins, uh, the Butler sends him to Barbados, but the Soberanis, the Alexander Clarks, Bustamante, sorry, and others. Is there a connection, is there any evidence of uh, correspondence between them? Because one is seduced by the notion of spontaneity. You've tried tonight to suggest they're, they're not necessarily spontaneous. They're all of these uh, factors swirling around. So one wonders if indeed they were writing to one another uh, from a, because it's six years. You have 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39. Six years in which in every territory almost there is some uh, disruption. So one wonders if they were um, more or less corresponding with one another. And, and the second point is this race. Race. I think that we, I know you said the Pan Africanism as a thrust, but many people try to drum race out of the 1930s disturbances, and they say it's economics. Yet in, South, in Trinidad, uh, the rioters or the demonstrators say there's a South African working in the oil fields and they object to his presence. And in Barbados we've seen statements by persons, JTC, Ramsey, etc., that race was a major uh, stimulant factor, right? So that's those two questions, please. Okay, um, let me take the last one first. Um, the core question, I think I've I did um, speak to the question of race. You might not necessarily have picked up. When I spoke about the Garveyism issue and, and the, and the black, national, black nationalism of Garvey, uh, when I spoke about Padmore and others, I was, already, was invoking the question of race. Um, I, it, it, one has to recognize that in a lecture of this kind, there is a limit to what you're going to uh, explore. In ter in ter I wouldn't have necessarily spent a long time on the question of race as a single factor. Race is always there, and we've already identified that um, in, in terms of not only not only in terms of the of the African element, but also in terms of the East Indian element in the in population. There is a question of race that is that is always that is always there. Um, in terms of um, in terms of of um, how it actually factors in, well, one only has one only has to again look at what people are saying at the time. What are the issues that they that they're raising? And although the, work, the, the race, racial issue is not always invoked, sometimes the people are using proxies for race. So there's a big discussion again. I mean, when I go for it, when you look at a, a people stealing from a plantation, for example, and, and you, may invoke, you may see it in terms of people being hungry and raiding plantations, you may also see it in terms of a moral economy be, being imposed. There's people that are identifying themselves at war with those who own the plantation, and those who own the plantations are African. For the most part, so the issue of race is there. In terms of the communication between these persons, without getting to being too elaborate, the answer is yes. That I'm not so certain specific about Bustamante himself, but there is an extensive correspondence going on between many of the labor leaders of the period. Um, I mentioned Marichaud. Marichaud is visiting practically every other Caribbean territory, and he's meeting with the labor leaders of the time. So the evidence is there that there is a, a correspondence going on, going on between. Them. That's why I'm saying. It's not just something that's spontaneous, that you actually have um, right there, right there, evidence of, um, of, of communication. And I suspect that, um, that the fellows um, um, were discussing strategy. And um, when we look at some of the writings, of, and it's a pity we don't have some of the autobiographies of some of the fellows behind. Yeah. When you look at Sierra James himself writing about the period, when you, see, when you look at what he's writing, you find clear evidence of the number of letters. I don't have time tonight to, yeah. to, to give you a, a list of, of, of persons, but it is there. And yeah, I've seen I the evidence, yeah. and I, I, I've read the evidence. Yeah. So it's there. Just want to um, add a, a footnote, just a footnote to them, uh, on the question of people reacting on the ground. Now here's a personal experience. I was in a potato ground this morning, some of us going to dig potatoes. I, and I, the I man, did sometimes, by eh? the rod. Eh? By the rod. By the rod. Yeah, I understand. I do. And the fellow decided on, on the orders of the plantation manager that he was not selling any potatoes. 
And we nearly saw a riot, a potato riot, at Searles this morning. <laughs> People decided we are going to dig the potatoes. If you do not sell them, we're going to... <laughs> so it pitched my back to 1937, another potato riot. And I, 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 I you would have been one of the leaders. <laughs> Nothing's so rude. You've been a leader. <laughs> Nothing's so rude. Yes. Yeah, this one. Okay, this would be the last question. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Welch. Uh, it's always so gracious to listen to you and to learn so much. You have just painted a picture for me. So I'm not going to ask you a question. I'm going to make two comments. One was the question on the women involvement in the struggle. If you then did analysis of the building of the family, the men would almost be excluded from the building of the family during that struggle because the women was concerned about the family when the men was doing other things. That's just my, my view and some research that I'm looking at of the importance of the women after slavery, yeah. okay. you know. Just before you go on, I'm not sure that the ladies would agree with you necessarily. Yeah. I'm not sure the ladies, but that's, a, that's another discussion. That's another discussion. <laughs> okay. But women was concerned about the family. But what you have painted to me tonight is the importance of Marcus Garvey's work, Honorable Marcus Garvey, and what you said came out of Nkuma's, uh contribution that Africa will become a single entity at some point. Now, what I'm asking the educators like yourself in Barbados in particular, at this moment in time, the African Union is reaching out to the Caribbean as the main, the central point of the African diaspora. And they're looking at CARICOM in particular. And the thing about it is that we, the people on the ground, don't know anything about it. So I'm, I'm charging yourself and people at the university to start educating our people of what is going down on the 25th of May 2012 in preparation for the United States of Africa starting with the decade for people of African descent from 2013. Start to educate the people of what is happening. That's what I'm charging you. After this series, there should be a series for the rest of the year educating our people about what is actually going down. Thank you very much. Uh, just, um, just, I don't, no, no one want to comment too much on, on what you just said, but that's the point that the University of West Indies is in fact engaged in a lot of activities, um, many of them which are pointed at the African diaspora. Um, you may be aware that, um, that, there, that there is going to be coming to a conference in September, I won't say too much about that, uh, which brings together persons of African descent from all over the world uh, who are going to be coming here um, to engage in discussions. Um, so that, um, that I, take the, I take the charge that you have given in the sense that, um, that you're asking for a further development of, gotcha. of what we're already engaging in. And I thank you for that charge. I'll pass it on to the relevant authorities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you again very much, um, Professor Welch. <laughs> I want to thank the audience for coming out tonight. Um, and contributing to the continuing success of this series, in my view. We want to again thank 
our sponsors, the Barbados Museum and Historical Society, the UWI's University of the West Indies Department of History and Philosophy, the National Cultural Foundation, the Central Bank of Barbados, and the Insurance Corporation of Barbados. And I hope very much that you will continue to attend in the future lectures in the series as we proceed along the way to celebrate this 75th anniversary of the 1930s, 1937 rebellion. Thank you very much and good night.